Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today for this next session of our workshops as part of the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, I'm Jill Terhar Lewis, and I'm the governor of the Mid-Atlantic region. And uh, I thank you for coming today. And I also thank our illustrious guests that we have here today. Uh, so let's get started. Um, last year okay, at, well, whoops, everyone. I'm sorry, just thank a second. Sorry, one second, making sure things are muted. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited to do this. Uh, last year, the Mid-Atlantic, for the first time, uh, hosted summer program auditions as part of their event. Um, and unfortunately, we had to pivot to online auditions for everything, but they just rolled with it just like um, it was smooth as could be. And it was really wonderful to have this opportunity for our students. And it has since grown into a national event. And this year, Nats offered a national event for summer program auditions. So we are really excited to have uh, four representatives from some of those programs here today to talk about um, auditions and all of the information that goes along with it to present our best selves uh, for these events for us and our students. So I'm going to read a little bit of information about our guests one at a time, just so we get to know who's with us here today. Um, and then I'm going to ask them to talk a little bit about their programs. So I'll introduce first and then we'll go around and talk about um, the individual programs. So thank you and welcome. So first we'll start with Stacy Trentiso, who will represent um, IPAI, uh, which is the International Performing Arts Institute. Uh, Stacy is a performer, an opera singer, coach, and creative expression consultant from Florida, currently living in Dresden, Germany. Uh, so it's a very different time zone there right now, so we're really glad she came today. Um, she currently works as a professional opera singer, artistic manager uh, for the International Performing Institute, uh, Performing Art Institute, and creative consultant for Opera Mississippi and the Natchez Festival of Music and a private coach, teacher and mentor for professional arts, um, artists, business owners, and young professionals. She's also a professional singer and has performed in various companies in the US and Germany and strives to present unique concerts that tell a story and express her own artistic voice. Welcome, Stacy. Will you say hello and tell us a little bit about your organization just to start us off? Sure. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I appreciate um, the invitation to be here and just to speak with you today and to join such an esteemed group of colleagues is really a pleasure. Um, so the EPI, as we call it, the German way, uh, in the International Performing Arts Institute is a training program um, that uh, offers training in musical theater and opera. Um, and we also do some training for young, um, no, I shouldn't say young because they're not always young, but uh, teachers and directors who are also performers or singers themselves. And we do this program every year in Kiefersfelden, Germany. <clears throat> this year, actually, it's taking place in Fairhope, Alabama. Because of the COVID crisis, we just couldn't uh, wait any longer to make a decision as to whether or not we were going to host it in Germany or host it in um, in the United States this year, I thought it was important that we did a live session this year. Um, and what we do is we try to connect students with um, faculty and guest artists in a more intimate, personal level. And uh, the, the focus is a, is a lot of mentorship that happens. We usually, the typical student or singer that comes to us is someone who's maybe in transition, trying to find a path and oftentimes a path that includes more than just one reality. So they're not just a singer or not just a teacher or not just a XYZ. They're trying to incorporate a number of things um, to, to um, fulfill their multiple interests and passions um, while expressing themselves artistically. Uh, and yeah, we, we, as I said, we meet every week or uh, every year in Kiefersfeld in Germany. It's a three week intensive uh, and they do uh, voice coaching and master classes. They do voice lessons, dance classes, movement classes. Um, they do, they work with some international guest artists and they also do a few performances. We have a, 
uh, two gala, we do a scenes program as well. We do two gala performances and uh, to, uh, a leader avant as well um, as some musical theater uh, song night performances as well. But the focus of our program is not really performance. It's, it is really that training and one-on-one -on -one mentorship that we try to offer students. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stacy. Um, our next panelist is Sarah Halley, who represents Ames Graz. Uh, she has a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Florida, and she has performed in Germany for five seasons before returning to the U.S., where she also is a performer. Uh, we're delighted to have her here and want to learn more about what um, uh, her program is like. So, Sarah, w welcome, and tell us a little more about your program. Thank you so much. Like uh, my colleague Stacy, I'm thrilled to be part of this discussion. It's a very important one on auditioning. And uh, I'm very grateful that you've asked me to, to participate. Ames in Graz is, uh, we'll be celebrating our 50th year in, in Graz, Austria, the next time we are able to hold the program. It was going to be last summer, but we had to cancel it completely. We had a board meeting today and it looks like we're going to do a mini version, but only that because as Stacy said, it's just, there's so many restrictions right now on uh, travel there, et cetera. So for the international programs like ours, it's, uh, it's really uh, quite complicated and we didn't think it would be uh, the same experience for everyone if we, if we held it in the States because just because of the, the parameters of our particular program. Uh, Ames is a six week, program. It's one of the longer international programs. We have a leader program and an opera program. Uh, also, we have no age limits. So we have uh, our participants range from very young singers in their undergrad to emerging professionals. We have a full orchestra, which is uh, one of the best orchestras of, of any anywhere you'll sing, not just at a summer program. And uh, we have five gala concerts with our orchestra and the Final is a is a competition, and we have approximately forty concerts with piano, uh, including uh, three three different leader studios. Um, it is more again, just like Stacy said, the focus is not on performance, although that's of course very important. But it's on uh, training and developing yourself as a professional. It's a bridge between being a student and uh, and being a, becoming a professional singer. So it's a very robust and uh, con we have many master classes and international stars that come for our master classes. And uh, it's something that I'm, I'm an alum, I attended in 1977. It was the most important step that I took towards becoming a professional singer. Uh, and uh, you know, I couldn't be more proud of Ames and, and our history. And so many, there's so many other programs out there now that, uh, that Ames was the first one. Our, found, our founders really hit on something special and it's still going strong. So thank you again for inviting me. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, right. your program is one of the first ones that I ever heard of too. So yeah. I'm glad to- And when you've been around that long, of course, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, our next guest is Cindy Sadler, who is here representing Spotlight on Opera.com. And I see she put her uh, website in the chat. So everybody should, uh, all of our guests should do that too, so they can learn from more information as well. Um, Cindy is the founder and executive director of the company and is an operatic contralto arts administrator, stage director, educator, and writer, and um, uh, has performed across Europe and the United States. Uh, she's also a contributor to the Middle Class Art Artist blog, as well as her own, and has contributed over 100 articles to Classical Singer magazine and is the author of the Student Singer Starter Kit. So welcome, Cindy. I know you have lots to tell us too. So thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Jill. I, I really appreciate your inviting me. And as the others have said, to get to hear about these other programs is really great and, and see put faces with some of these programs that I've heard of um, over the years, especially Graz. Um, so I am, as, as you said, I'm the executive director of Spotlight on Opera, and this is our 15th anniversary season. Um, we started off in Austin, Texas, and are now located in Shreveport, Louisiana, on the campus of Centenary College of Louisiana, um, and uh, which is a beautiful little campus um, that we kind of have to ourselves during the summer, so it's, it's kind of nice. Uh, this year, our program, we have not decided whether we're going to be live or virtual. We're going to make that decision in April, um, and we 
sort of learned from our experience last year when we had to pivot at the last minute and take everything online, which I'm happy to say we were able to do successfully. Um, but this time we, we arranged for it ahead of time. So we have plans and when people apply to our program, they get to say whether they're interested in doing virtual or live at, or if they don't care, they'll do it either way. And we have a price difference too in the tuition. Um, so we're, we're prepared for that. We offer classes in acting, business of singing, marketing and branding, stage intimacy, co uh, conducting seminar, um, regional careers, all kinds of master classes. And we're very flexible. So sometimes if the students say, hey, could we do this? Then we'll come up with a way to have a class in that. Um, we are, we are, our mission, our motto is opera for everybody. And our mission is to bring a transformative experience to our students and our faculty who work with us. Um, we consider ourselves to really be kind of one big family. We are living in each other's faces for four weeks, um, or five weeks. And we, uh, we really pride ourselves on a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention to our students and meeting them where they are right then. Um, we are not necessarily, we have students of all different kinds. We have people who are straight out of undergrad. We have people who, we even sometimes have people who have management who just wanna come and sing a role with us um, and everything in between. But most of our students are, are sort of in the undergrad or grad student level. Um, and uh, in addition to classes, we do a lot of performances. This year we are doing La Traviata, we're doing L'Enfant et les Sorelèges. Our touring children's opera is Goldie B. Locks and the Three Singing Bears. Um, and then we'll have opera scenes and live concerts as well. Um, some of these will take place on, if we have to go virtual, some of these will obviously take place on Zoom. Um, and we have a sort of little bit of a reduced schedule if we do that. But um, we're very happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. And you can always email me directly at cindy at spotlightonopera.com if you have any such questions. We audition only by video. And um, auditions and applications are open until we've cast everybody. So we're still taking applications right now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Cindy. Uh, next, we're going to move to Ari Strasser, who's here to represent ArtsBridge. And um, Ari has, uh, is Vice President for Artistic Programs and joined the ArtsBridge team in 2012. She brings expertise in working with individuals and groups of students on the artistic components of preparing for summer programs, portfolio reviews, auditions, and pre-screening recordings. She's a Minnesota native and is an active performer as a pianist, singer, songwriter, and actor. So welcome, Ari. Please tell us more about your program. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Jill. Um, just like everyone has said here, I'm so grateful to be here and you know have a chance to share some information about what we do and um, answer some questions and just to meet you all. Um, <laughs> so uh, I've been working with ArtsBridge since 2012. ArtsBridge runs summer programs, amongst other things, but um, one of the major things we do is run summer programs, and we have four different ones. We run um, a classical voice program, art song, um, two different musical theater programs, and we also have an acting program. Um, they're all two weeks, two week intensives, and they run at exactly the same time. So what's kind of neat about that is we're able to um, have some crossover faculty kind of teach master classes during the two week program. Um, so I'd say the most unique thing about what ArtsBridge Summer does is the, the classes are taught by college faculty from different schools and conservatories and universities. So um, each one of those four programs, the faculty is made up of um, faculty from various schools. So it's almost like a, a little buffet. You get a chance to kind of work with some different faculty from different schools and, and get a sense of their program. Um, and the main goal of the program, interestingly enough, I know we're here to talk about auditions, is that the two week summer program for all four of them is focused on preparing for college auditions. So it's for high school students, um, mostly rising seniors, though we do have students um, in every high school age, um, 15 and up. And um, you get a chance to work with those college faculty people and learn what it is that makes up a great college audition. So all four of them, that's, that's our goal. 
Outstanding. That's really wonderful. Um, I'm so glad to hear so much from all of you about uh, helping to prepare people for beyond your program as well, as rather than just looking for uh, workhorses to do the things for a production company or some something like that. It's just a, really a, an important thing to think of the longevity of the careers of the people you're working with and a wonderful thing to do. Um, I'm wondering, uh, when you have an audition from somebody, it's a really short glimpse of time that you get to uh, evaluate the person. So I'm wondering what kinds of things you're looking for um, from that initial first impression and uh, what helps people to stand out um, in your estimation? And would anybody like to take that first? I can. Okay, great, Sarah. <laughs> Our auditions, when we do them live, this year they will all be uh, online, but traditionally, I travel to 20 to 25 cities throughout the United States to hear auditions. Each audition is 20 minutes long. Uh, they sing usually two selections. The, the requirements are that they have five arias, uh, but we usually hear two. And then we talk to them about the program because there is so much to talk about and we have so much going on. And people need to set their goals in order, you know, before they even come to Ames because you can quickly get overwhelmed, especially the younger singers. So. Uh, we take a lot of time with each person. Um, for me, the most important thing when I hear an audition is, you know, just the first impression, of course, is very important. You know, your appearance, the things that you can control is the way you look, the way you dress. Is it flattering? What are you standing in front of? You know, do you have on a bright enough color, et cetera? Just that first impression is very important. Secondly, um, it's very important, I think, that you know the program that you are auditioning for. I'm sometimes very surprised that, that people have no idea what Ames is. They just, especially in New York, people will just sign up for an audition for the experience, which is fine. But um, I understand that that need and, and I actually enjoy that. But I've also had people pay their whole tuition and then uh, write to me and say, well, when am I going to find out what role I'm singing? We don't do any stage productions at all at Ames. So if that's what you're looking for, a role, we're not the right program. So, uh, you know, ours is a polishing program, a study program, and we do a lot of concerts, but we do gala concerts with orchestra and then many concerts with piano. We have a Greta program, we have spirituals, we have Broadway. And so you should know who you're singing for and what that program can offer you and whether it's the right fit. It's a very expensive to do an international program. So uh, you wanna make sure that uh, you are, no, you know, you should do one, one international program if you are going to be an opera, I, be I believe. And so make it count and really get a lot out of it. But preparation, 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 I think. Really good. Does anybody have something they want to add? I, that seemed pretty thorough, but I wonder if there were other things that you all are looking for as well um, in the auditions. Yeah, um, I, I can follow up with that because yeah. we're also an international program. And I just want to second everything that Sarah said, especially the, the know the program part. Um, and take, so I would always encourage people and anyone who asks me these questions, the first place is to go to the website and just check it out and make sure you, you know, the, that the program is the right fit for you. And if you're not sure, if you, if you don't know by looking at the website, then contact somebody and just ask all the questions. Cause I mean, we're all here. And I, I would venture to say that most training programs anyway, are, are we want to connect with you. That's the whole point. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and so it's just sending an email to clarify something. If you have a question is, is really powerful sometimes. Um, I would say just to add to um, the first impression part for me, the, of course the look is important. Um, but for me, it's, it's about how that person expresses the inside of themselves from the very beginning when they walk into the room. And I think we can, um, we can see that if you're, I hate to say the word confident because a lot, of, this is a hot topic, I think for all performers, how do I, how do I be confident? How do I show people that I'm confident? And it's, it's not about being confident. It's just being you and being okay with that, wherever you are in that day, in that moment in time and opening yourself up and being vulnerable and showing yourself to us in the best, best ability that you can. Um, and I think that takes, um, it takes mental preparation for sure. Um, 
But choosing repertoire that represents you is really important and not just singing. And I'm speaking also as a singer who has done auditions for these programs, um, you know, the, like mine and, um, you know, choosing repertoire, not just because somebody said that you should sing that because this is what every soprano sings and that, that's difficult or it will show your high notes really well, but choosing something that you, especially for these programs that you're not auditioning for a role that really expresses who you are and that you can really connect with because then you're going to be confident when you walk into the room. You're not going to worry about what we're going to think about you necessarily. You're just going to be having fun and singing. Um, and that's something you can see when we get to talking about uh, video auditions comes across really clearly, in my opinion, um, in a video audition. Um, yeah, as long as you can see them, <laughs> this is also the problem that you, you often <laughs> Yeah, who you are right now rather than 10 years down the road too, probably. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that is really big, really big. And also for, for training programs, you know, we understand that, I mean, for, for us, you're, you're in transition probably. You're looking for something, especially these international programs. Um, for Sarah and myself, the students are coming over here because they also just want to explore the culture. They want to know, um, is this an option for them? Um, and um, it, just be who you are and, and don't try to play towards uh, something that doesn't exist for you in that moment in time. Yeah, it's pretty high stakes, you know, uh, if you're thinking about all of these things that are first impression, how you look, what you're wearing, uh, what does the lighting look like, and all of the things in a, a videoed audition uh, is something that you have a lot more control over than a live audition, too. So I wonder, um, Cindy, uh, what would you say about a live uh, versus video audition and these first impressions, and um, have you noticed changes between the two types of auditions? Well, the main change that I have noticed is that people have gotten a lot better over the past year at doing these um, these video auditions. And specifically, some of my students from one of my programs last year, I mean, I rem this is one of the things we were teaching them at the time while we were figuring out ourselves. We were all figuring it out together. But I've seen some of their audition videos this year, and they look great. You know, they're so poised. They are, they're, they're, they look, they look wonderful. They've got the lighting correct. They have a neutral background. And, um, and a couple of people have gotten very creative with their videos in a way which you would not be able to do on a lot in a live audition. You know, it's kind of frowned on. You're supposed to stand there and, you know, use this to tell the story, not props and stuff. But I kind of enjoy the creativity nonetheless. Um, as far as live auditions go, it, it's, it's, you know, you don't get second chances in live auditions. Videos are great because you, if you don't like your take, you can go back and do another one and, you know, show yourself at, at your best. And, in, um, and I wish more young singers would do that, would take that opportunity to do it. Um, uh, young singers are generally so, feel so trapped by all the rules and they don't know what all the rules are. So one of the things that I really like to do is try to demystify that for them. And um, I, in, well, I agree with, with so much of what Stacey and Sarah s said about the importance of choosing the program. I think that is in, in knowing what program you're getting into and what you really what your goals for yourself are. That is critical to having a good experience. Um, but we're all different programs that they are polishing programs. We are a next steps program. What, wherever you're coming to, to whatever level you're coming to us at, we want to help you get to that next step. Maybe you need to be polished. We can do that. But maybe you just need to have your first experience on stage. And we love to do that for you, too. So what I look for in auditions, first and foremost, is energy. Um, so many of the young singers that will get up there and they don't realize that the audition starts from the minute we see you, not from the minute you start singing. So if you stand there and say, say I would like to sing O Del Mio Dolce Ardor. Oh, you know, that's not interesting to me. I, I still love you. I still know where you're coming from. But as a director and as somebody who works with young singers, I want to know that there is something there for me to work with. And that you show me that by your energy, by the way you approach it, look like you want to be there. If you don't lie, that's part of your job as an actor. <laughs> yeah. Fake it till you make it, baby. Um, and, you know, and look like you want to be there, have some understanding of what you're singing, you know, um, show me that you can act, not just that you can sing. That's important too. 
you know, audition for the job you want to get. And if you haven't done the, the research to know which roles you are appropriate for, then, you know, you're not going to get one of those roles. That's okay too. Some of these people are babies. They just don't know. And that's part of what they're here to learn. Um, but that's what I, I want to see that energy, that willingness to learn, that interest, that passion. I actually don't care where the singing is good or not. We can fix that. <laughs> you know, yeah, um, yeah. we, you know, to, to a point, as far as just getting into the program, that's not the most essential thing. I want to, like, like Stacy said, I want to see who you are and what you are bringing to this, this art, what kind of art you want to make. You need to have an opinion as an artist. And that's hard sometimes for young singers to show, but that's what I want to see. I want to see that you have an opinion and that you're eager to share it. Excellent. And Ari, would you care to add to that? And maybe in particular for younger singers too, that I think you said you work with high school students too, as well. That might be um, interesting to note if there's differences between the two. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I'm he hearing, it's so great to hear you all speak about this. And, you know, Cindy, you just touched on something that I think is so important. It's, you know, we want to hear you, we want to get to know you. I mean, you all touched on that. And I think that, um, you know, that's true, whether or not you're auditioning online or you're submitting a video or you're auditioning in person, right? It's a chance for you to show you and, and for whoever's auditioning you to get to know who you are um, as a person. And um, I think there's so many ways to do that. And one of the major ways, and, you know, Stacy, you mentioned uh, on this as well as your choice of material, right? That's your, that's an opportunity to show us something about you. And I think, um, you know, when you're not auditioning for a role, it's a huge opportunity, right? It's that you, you don't have to pick a, 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 a choice that shows something um, specific to show that you are, you know, well suited to a specific role. It's a chance to just show, show us something about you. You know, why did you choose that piece? And I think students should be prepared to answer that question as well. You know, what drew you to it? Um, and why did you choose it? Not just because it shows I can sing up to, you know, up to there, um, but um, something, um, you know, really more personal about it. Um, I also think that, you know, I'll just add about, you know, auditioning online and submitting videos. Um, we've always done that at ArtsBridge. Um, we've, that's how we've always uh, had students audition for all of our programs. So um, that's no different this year. And I do think um, one interesting thing about it is it just sort of levels everything, you know, everyone is, everyone is submitting a video. So, you know, you have a chance to do as many takes as you want, which is sometimes a blessing and a curse, as we all know, you know, getting that perfect take and feeling like, okay, I can let that go or no, I definitely need to fix that. You know, certain, certain little things that stick out to you. Um, but I do like that it kind of levels things that way. Um, also, we are, we were a virtual summer program last year and we will be again in this summer. Um, and I do think that it's, it's so helpful for students to get a sense of what it's like to work online and what it's like to audition online. Um, even when many auditions do go back to being in person, I think, you know, a pre-screen is a part of many audition processes. And so to really uh, master that skill of being able to um, show what you can do in a video um, and show who you are through that, I think is a really important skill however we however we go that's really great um i'm wondering how important it is for your singers that are coming in to have interests other than singing or maybe a field of study that is of interest to them in addition to singing and are you finding that artists are needing to have multi uh directional interests to, to an extent in order to be successful um does anybody feel compelled to <laughs> speak on that. I'd love to speak on that because yeah. that's sort of one of my soapbox issues. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> and, and it's not just because of the pandemic, but I've always felt, I mean, let's, let's look at it this way. The truth is that there's a very, very small percentage of people who make it to whatever you define as the top of our profession. Um, and which is fine. You know, they work hard to get there. But that doesn't mean the people who don't make it to the top, who make it to the middle or the lower middle or the very, very rusty bottom are not artists and don't deserve a platform. And 
I'm actually more, I personally am more interested in helping those people. I mean, sure, if a star comes along, I want to help them. I want to help anybody who wants to be an artist. But I love the people who aren't going to be the stars just as much. And I think that they, they're they very important and often overlooked in our business because they're the people that are buying the tickets. They're the people who are supporting everything. And they are creating fantastic art, as we are seeing now in the pandemic, when we all have more time to pay attention to it. I mean, if you get on TikTok for five minutes, you're going to hear some amazing singing. You're going to hear and see incredible moving 60 seconds of creativity across across you know all different genres and all these people um you know pairing up to do all these cool and interesting things so grassroots opera grassroots music making is very important and i think that one of the great blessings of the pandemic is that we have learned we can all be content makers we can all find an audience and I think it's really important to encourage students to learn some of that. Because even if you are going to be a star, you're not going to boom be a star. You're going to have to climb the staircase to get there. And that means you're going to have to be doing other things in the meantime. And even if you are a star, there's, you know, this happens, roller coaster. So everybody needs to have those other skills that they can apply and other interests. Um, so I yes, I think that it's really important to provide people with those opportunities to explore whatever they're interested in, because you don't know what that is going to end up being for them later in life. I can add to that as well. Um, just, you know, I, I know that Cindy said uh, she, her program is a next steps program, and we do incorporate that into our program as well, in that we do have a, a so many areas that we work in with the, with musical theater and operatic and leader performing, but also the teaching and the directing fellowships that we do as well. Um, and a huge part of our musical theater uh, program is a crossover um, aspect where the singers are doing, you know, they, and you, you really have, I would say you have to, especially in the United States, but um, really hone your crossover skills and be able to sing more than one thing. And I think I have, I am with Cindy and I have always agreed that it, that as a singer, you, I believe that you ought to have something else that, that feeds you as well. That is who you are. Something that I recently came across, um, is a, a, an interview where a woman a entrepreneur quoted, if you take your, your product away, if there is no product, what's left? And that's literally what's happened to us in this industry right now is that we don't have a product. We can't sing in front of people in the way that we used to be able to do that. And so what I find is that there's, you know, I feel like it's very important for us to, to make music, to express, but it has to be meaningful in my opinion. And I see there's a lot of wonderful, great, meaningful things. And, and who am I to say what's meaningful or not? We each have to decide that for ourselves. But at the same time, just to have a product, just to have a product is, is also, I think it becomes noise at some level. Um, but having other things that feed you, not just being on stage in front of people um, and finding out what those things are, I think is an important part, not only to have a well-balanced life, but also to bring meaning to actually when you are standing on stage singing in front of people at whatever level that is, whether that's you know a regional level, whether it's the level of you standing in front of your family in your home, or or whether it's on a big stage, you know, uh, anywhere um, in the world. And, you know, I think a big part of what singers try to learn, what we try, what I try to help singers understand is what does it mean to actually be in the industry? What does that actually entail? What does it mean? What do you need to, to succeed inside the industry? Because if you can do that, if you can understand that, then you can also understand what it takes to break out as well and not just follow the traditional path. But you have to understand it first. It's like, you know, when you're learning a language, you you learn all the rules and then you learn how to break the, one, the ones that you want um, in order to be more creative, to be more expressive. And so I think it's important to learn the industry, whatever that is that you, wherever your goal is, if you want to stand on the 
you know, big stage, or if you, if you want to go come over to Europe and try your hand over here, learn about that and then decide, okay, do I really want to do that? Um, I understand now what it takes to do that. Can I do it my way? And by the way, I just want to say go Gators because I'm also a Gator. <laughs> Me too. I wanted to say it. <laughs> um, we have a question from the audience. We have uh, Dr. Jackson is asking, I'm really interested in what you mentioned as bridging from studio to stage. Do you have suggestions for singers who this will be their first audition for a summer program? Good question. <laughs> Who wants to take that? <laughs> I can. I mean, speak I'm to happy that. to. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I can speak to that because um, we get a lot of those for our program um, because we're we are not quite the level of aims as far as um, polishing goes. We ju we just don't have the same sort of performance opportunities and the orchestra and all of that. You have to be at a certain level in order to stand in front of an orchestra and sing. Mm -hmm. So we we have a, a really wide variety of students. We have students who are, we've even had high school students come, uh, older high school students who are, who are usually seniors coming on our musical theater side. I don't know that we've had a high school student on our opera side. Um, and so I can say, you know, it's this, it's the same advice um, that we've already said is even if it's your first audition, um, be yourself. That's the number one thing. Get a coach or, or a teacher to review what you're offering and make sure that that is you, that you do it over, especially for video auditions right now, but that you do it over and over again until you're comfortable. So um, create mock audition opportunities for yourself. Uh, so that you get comfortable singing with the repertoire that you're going to sing in that audition. Um, and do as much as you can to relax yourself. Um, and um, it, don't be afraid, again, going back to just be yourself. Don't be afraid of being yourself. Because I, I would say that all of us, I, maybe I speak for all of us, is that we, even if you have, even if you flub it, okay, even if you have a terrible audition, we can tell normally <laughs> uh, we can tell if it's if it's a if it's going to be a good fit um, and even if you have a terrible audition I can also say this as a singer or there have been times where I've had terrible auditions that I got the role because I just and I was totally shocked because I was just myself um, and I, I think that's that's the most important thing but maybe my colleagues can add to that as well for us for bridging the gap between education and and a, a singing career, we focus on that a lot of things. Of course, you have to be of a certain age. In your audition, you can, you can express that, and we will also know by looking at your resume, okay, this person is ready. They've already done this, these many roles, and maybe they just want to, uh, you know, get a job in Europe where there is, tends to be, you know, more work, and you can live there normally. You can, you don't have to travel as much, etc. So we focus on that. We have a component of AIMS, which is audition training all summer long, where you are criticized up and down. We have somebody specifically for, you know, stage department, what you should wear. Uh, everybody who stands on our stage is required to show their gown to this person, you know, before they get up there and in front of a, an, a live audience. But we also have uh, agents who come to AIMS. And that's really the biggest bridge, probably. You know, that's how you're going to get work over there. That we have an in-house agent at Ames that I've known since he was a child, and now he has grown children. And uh, he's honest and uh, kind, which is often not, those words are often not in combination with the word agent. He's very supportive of young singers. He gets a lot of, of uh clients from us too. So he's very eager to, to work for us, but he has audition training seminars where he will say that is not really an aria that's good for you in this country or, uh, you know, that kind of advice, which is very valuable. And what agents in German, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland are looking for, um, what's the current hot thing what it's like to live over there, what you need to do, you need to have an address, et cetera. There is a lot of discussion, this is one portion of AIMS, about bridging that, that gap between studying and, and getting work. We have uh, master classes from Linda Watson, Barbara Bonney, um, 
and people and both Skobus, who's a Danish baritone, and they will often say, "Come to Vienna and study with me," um, and, and that they have a lot of contacts. So the networking at, at Ames is very valuable. We have uh, international conductors. We usually have two Germans, an Italian, and, a, and an Austrian. And just networking with the conductors themselves, you work with them for a week and in private coachings and orchestra rehearsals. Um, so there's a lot of bridging opportunities there. It's a, networking is one of the most valuable things about Ames. Our faculty is also pulled from universities all across the United States. That's how we recruit. And, um, and then the faculty can recruit maybe masters or doctoral students to bring back. So um, there's a lot of bridging going on. <laughs> Lots of choices. Excellent. Oh, yes, Ari, were you going to say something? Yeah. Well, I mean, I just, uh, I was hearing the word bridge. I, we're, our company's name is Arts Bridge, obviously. Um, but we, um, we're more bridging, <laughs> yes, we're more bridging the gap between high school and college um, and, and helping um, these students find the right college fit for them. Um, and um, it's interesting what you say about kind of learning about what, you know, oh, that aria is not good to sing here or something like that. I think, you know, one of the huge benefits of, of what we do at ArtsBridge Summer is the students get a chance to hear from the faculty who sit on the other side of the table all day and say, you know what, you can sing that, but I hear it a hundred times a day. So if you're going to sing it, make sure you bring something that's really you to it, you know, or, um, or just um, those little things that they look for that we're all talking about um, when students audition. So um, it is interesting to have people like that as part of the faculty to help students understand what it is that people are looking for in these auditions. That brings me to a silly question that I had. Um, I know you probably have listened to hundreds or thousands of auditions. Are there songs on your I don't ever want to listen to them again list? And I wonder what they are, if they are, if you have any that you well, they like. are, but I would never tell anybody. You would never say, never say. I have my personal, uh, but, <laughs> you know, it's not really fair to the students to, to say that, you know, how are they going to feel when they walk in and sing the R.A. you hate? Yeah, exactly. that's true. It's not about that. <laughs> I would never say that to them. And, and like has been said before, if it's the aria you love, you need to sing it. And it always comes across. Sometimes you'll hear three different things. And I'll say to the singer, you really liked that one, didn't you? Because it's a whole different demeanor. They're comfortable with it. It sits well in their voice. It's who they are. So even if I hate it, <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> it's not about me. You know, they are, you know it's just not about me. So. But there are some I hate. Sure. <laughs> you can appreciate the artistry exactly. that they're bringing to a piece that you don't like, right. you know, and that's what you're there to pay attention to anyway. It's not about the piece. Right. Not if, you can, if you can make us like the piece that we hate, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a couple of years ago, we have this big competition at the end of Ames, the Meister Singer. And this girl sang it. She's from Vanderbilt, lovely girl. And she, um, she gosh, now I can't even remember the name of the aria, but I hate that aria. I hate it. And she sang it in her audition at Vanderbilt. She sang it at her, you know, everybody, you sing for our faculty when you get to Ames. She sang it in an orchestra concert and then she sang it in the competition. So I heard that aria a lot and she won. And it was so good in the competition. I was just like, wow, I really love that. So if you sing it with your heart and you love it, you know it works for you, you know, it's successful. You, know? you just never know. You've got to feel it. I mean, I don't know why you would sing if you're not going to feel what you're singing. And why do this very difficult, almost impossible career if it doesn't bring you joy? and you don't want to express who you are and what the composer is, when it works, there's nothing better than what we do. It's just really difficult. 
I'm yeah, rambling. There's, there's reasons why you hear them all the time because they're great audition pieces and they tell right. a lot right. um, and stand out. So that's good. It's just fun to think about those that I never want to hear the <laughs> Mezzo Na National Anthem again. You know, <laughs> because we do program, we have certain themes in our orchestra concerts, like a journey through Italy or something, sort of these general themes. We will list suggested repertoire that we might program with our orchestra. So in the in the hearings, was what we call our auditions at the beginning, sometimes you will get one aria over and over. You just want to, when we have about a hundred people that come to Ames, this is a big program. And sometimes you'll just hear that aria until you just got to keep your face straight. Like, okay, here we go again with O Quante Volte or whatever. <laughs> I, I have a. I have a question to follow. I'm sorry, Cindy. Um, I'll ask my question in just a minute. <laughs> no, go ahead. You go first. Um, I didn't want to take it away from the topic at hand, but I, my question is for my colleagues. Um, if How do you feel about repertoire that is um, outside of, I mean, because you get the standards. And I've, I've heard both opinions uh, about this, that people prefer to hear you in a standard because then they they know, you know, where you stand, maybe a little bit easier, or do you prefer to hear someone who sings outside of the, you know, the norm at maybe a more obscure piece? I'm just curious. Well, I'll go ahead and take that since I, because it, it ties into what I was going to say. And, and, and what I was going to add before I address that is that um, very oftentimes in choosing repertoire, you know, young singers have their magic five arias. They've been told they have to have those five arias. And of course, the older you get and the more the more uh, distant from your schooling you get, the more you realize that you got to have more than those five. You have to have your 15 or 20 that you take in. And you also have to have, you don't have to have one of each flavor, like uh, like you're often taught that you have to have your German piece and your, your English piece and your contemporary piece and all of those things. You just sing what you sing. And that's a big re revelation, to, revelation to a lot of young singers. But there's a reason why they sing those same arias. It's because they're good learning arias. It's because it's what's within their scope. What I would say is over and over again today, we've heard from, from everybody, sing what makes you happy, sing what you're passionate about. And I would say for young singers, don't worry too much about Fach, especially if you're an undergraduate. It's, it's meaningless. It's absolutely meaningless. Just sing what you sing really well. And that's what's going to be communicated. I do One of the best auditions I've ever had to date for Spotlight was an undergraduate freshman girl who came in and sang one of the 24 Italian songs in Arias. But she sang it with her own voice and, and a great deal of conviction. She knew what every word meant. You know, she had done her homework and she sang it with all of her technique that day. And I would rather hear that than hear somebody come in and try to do uh, La Traviata without being able to really master it because they think that they have to show off something flashy. So um, back to the question about contemporary or, you know, obscure stuff. I think that it is wise to have a balance. You should always have at least one standard aria. But the rest of it, as far as I'm concerned, can be all quote unquote weird stuff, you know? I, I'm happy to learn something too. What the main thing is, I want to see what you can do. Mm. But you need to. I, I would say you. It, it kind of also depends on where you are in your career. You know, the kids they sing what they can sing. As you get more towards being a professional, then you have to fine tune it a lot more. But I think that it would be a mistake to walk in and have nothing standard to offer whatsoever, or to have nothing yes. contemporary. I think also one of the dangers of the, of the, the recorded auditions and, and doing an obscure piece, that's fine. But if you're doing a, a, a live audition and you walk in with something so obscure that the pianist is not gonna be able to handle it, people tend to discount the importance of a pianist. And I say pianist because it's not an accompanist. This is something we harp on at Ames. That is your collaborator. And if you walk in, even something like the composer aria, that's risky and they can, they can mess you up. So if you are gonna do something like that in a live audition, maybe try to contact the pianist in advance to see if they know it or meet with them in advance. But I think that doing something very obscure is risky uh, for that reason, as well as, like you say, you can't, you don't, it, sometimes they don't show anything. They don't show any range. They might show your acting, which is good. 
But I, I agree with Cindy, there should be at least one standard on your list. Uh, in our auditions, you get to pick whatever, you know, come out and sing what you want until, until you're comfortable. And you should sing something that you can sing when you're half dead, sick, tired. You need that standard aria that always makes you shine. And then the adjudicator can choose maybe that obscure aria. And sometimes I do. I like the Heggy songs and, you know, there's some... I'm more of a traditionalist, but some of them are just great. And if I'm familiar with it, even if it's contemporary, I enjoy it a little more. But some of the things I heard in the spa, a thing I had never heard them before. It was interesting. I like to learn too, like Cindy said. <laughs> we met so's, you know, we're very. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say as, as a professional singer who frequently uses Baba the Turks aria in auditions, my trick is just to, take a pianist I know can play it, you know, at a certain point. And you don't always have that option, especially right. if you're in Europe, you, you don't know who you're going to end up with a lot of the time. But when I audition in New York, I have my go-to guys. If I'm singing something really difficult, I am going to spend the extra money to hire somebody who can play my repertoire. But you know, there are some people that just don't have that much difficult. Some voice types don't have a lot of crazy difficult repertoire. So, you know, you're probably okay then. I will say, just speaking to, to German auditions, there are two, two things that, and um, Sarah can correct me also if she has a different opinion, but I, just going back to the Pfaff thing as well, it's a little more important over here than it is in the United States at this moment in time. Um, and it doesn't mean that you can't sing outside of it um, or that you can't sing what you want. It's just that you, again, it goes back to just being aware of what the industry is like and what the industry is like around you coaching with people in that industry, getting to know what the expectations are, the general expectations are, so that you know how to play in that field and, and break the rules if you wanna break the rules. Um, and that's kind of more of an upper level thing and, and probably what Sarah talks about a lot, and I'm mm -hmm. sure um, at Ames, is how to, how to really learn that, especially specifically in Europe. Um, and the other thing I did wanna mention, I have found um, it, that pianists here are stellar uh, and you actually you do get every audition that I've ever attended you get a, a moment to prepare with the pianist you know if it's going to be for a theater here um, especially for theaters I remember the first theater audition I had here I asked I emailed ahead of time and said do I need to pay the pianist and they were so offended <laughs> no we have a house pianist here you don't have to pay you know because they do as Sarah said that you you do you, they make a living doing these things, you know, and it's not that you don't in the United States, but it's contracted living that includes health insurance and it includes benefits and you get paid for every audition that you do, you know, sort of a thing. So, so I will, I will say, I will speak. I've never had a bad pianist here. I have had quite a few bad ones in the United States. Thank, maybe I just got lucky so far, but well, so there's a big difference between a collaborative pianist that does that for a living and a pianist that maybe is just studying piano at the conservatory and they have really have no idea of vocal rep. For me, the most difficult faculty member to hire is a coach that you have to know. Piano, all the styles, all the languages, that's a really rare thing. And that's really what you should have, you know, accompanying you in an audition. That's really not gonna happen very often unless you are, you know, auditioning in Berlin or something at the big opera, you know, that kind of a, a real collaborative person. So trying to get together and, and, and audition is great if you can make it work, um, using a pianist that you trust and that's important. But if you can't, then maybe not put that really super difficult aria on your rep list. Save yourself some <laughs> uh, Before we finish up, I just was wondering if, uh, do you require resumes or any other um, uh, paper or uh, photo materials and if you had any advice about constructing those documents that go along with the audition. Yes, we do. And a, a photo and a, and a resume. And in, in Austria, we help them create a German, a German version, which is a little bit different. We have a, a class on that. Everybody, I think, requires a resume these days, right? Yeah, we yeah. require a resume and a yeah. photo. Um, yeah, it's good practice. One thing that I always tell young singers is, you know, you when they, you know, Ames is expensive, and our top scholarship is five thousand dollars, and the 
their tuition is almost seven. So, so, you know, they have to give benefit recitals and raise money and they balk at that. They freak out. They're, they're shy about it. They're, they're, they're not used to having to do that. But marketing yourself is a big part of this business. You just got to get used to it saying, I'm great. Here's my stuff, you know, and uh, they, they do they do balk at that. But part of it is, you know, doing a good resume and just thinking of different ways that you can make yourself stand out because there's especially for lyric sopranos. That's a big part of what we teach at Spotlight, too. We have a whole class. In fact, I teach it both in Spotlight and independently about press kits about putting together your resume, headshot, bio. Bio writing is something that everybody hates to do. So I came up with a formula that you can just basically plug in the information that you need. And that seems to help a lot, but we do all of that. We also do websites and sound clips and all of those things. Social media nowadays, it's very important. And we work with kids a lot on on things like, you know, just basically business etiquette because a lot of them don't know. I mean, how many of you guys have gotten an email as a professor that says, hey, just starts <laughs> off with, hey, <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's, that's my favorite. Um, anyway, uh, but, but yeah, I think it's, we, we require a uh, resume, headshot and bio, and then to assuage the kids that don't have those things and will panic when you ask for them. You know, we sort of explain, if you don't have a resume, just send us a repertoire list of what you've worked on or if you don't have a headshot just you know take a picture of yourself with your with your smartphone that's fine right. um because i think it's important this as you mentioned as sarah mentioned it's an investment to do a summer program and you know ideally we'd be able to have them all come for free i'd love that i'd love it if i didn't have to charge a cent to any of these kids to come but my faculty also needs to eat so <laughs> um but but they we need to help them in every way we possibly can and so you know if we can prep them with things like that to go to the next step to where they can go to Ames in a couple of years and sing with the orchestra and maybe get an agent and then you know come in there knowing what to do so they can concentrate on what they need to concentrate there then i consider that a success right. Like I said, they need to set goals. You say, okay, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to work on my audition repertoire. I'm going to work on German and or what, you know, or my acting, because we do have acting classes as well, taught by actors and not stage directors in opera. And that's always one of our most popular um, uh, classes because they don't teach that in the United States in the music schools. So, um, and yeah. Totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> goals, you have to set your goals. Yeah. yeah. Angle, yeah. I, I, I have one. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I just have one thing to add about the resume and headshot thing. I, um, we also do, uh, you know, uh, kind of a branding masterclass in an awareness, you know, kind of branding awareness masterclass where we um, encourage the students and teach them what basically I go through headshots and resumes, I don't choose theirs unless they tell me I can. I'm like, well, if you wanna be an example, tell, please let me know uh, ahead of time and we'll use you as an example. But I will go through my headshots because I have a series of terrible to better ones <laughs> and talk about the different stages of where you, where you start because you have to start somewhere. And then, you know, then you get a friend with a camera to take your picture, then you pay somebody a little better and then you get professional ones. And so, you know, it's important to kind of show those, those stages, but at the same time, it, ne it needs to be said that we have sometimes hundreds of people applying to these programs. And while I, I because we're a training program, the resume is not the most important thing. It's more important for programs like Ames, of course, because there has to be a certain level of experience there in order to participate. For us, you don't you don't need that level of experience. Um, and in fact, we're similar to Cindy in that we we try to aim for students who have maybe not achieved that yet to try to help them get to that point in whatever direction they want to go. And um, it, but but it really is a competition as far as getting into these things because we have limited numbers of spaces. And so when it, your resume needs to have, I mean, it, it is a picture of how much you value this application and how much time that you've put into it. Please do a resume, try, do your best, get somebody to help you format if you need to. 
and make sure that everything is on that resume. It doesn't have to be the most beautiful thing in the world, but spend time on it. Because if you just send me um, a, a list of you know accomplishments that are not organized or that don't have dates, which I have very much gotten, uh, or a business resume that tells me that you worked at um, you know Cha Cha's Italian restaurant or something, I've gotten that too. It's crazy. <laughs> um, uh, then it tells me that either maybe you're not quite ready or that you didn't take enough time. Again, it goes back to learning about the program that you're auditioning for, right? Knowing what their expectations are. Um, and the same thing with a headshot. I, you can get some really great headshots with an iPhone, but make sure that you take the time and find somebody to do that. Don't stand in the hallway of your school and take a selfie. Please go to a place where you, where you have a neutral background, get a friend, get good lighting. Okay. Spend a little time. You don't have to have money, but it takes time to make these things look professional. Um, until you have the money, you got to put in the time. Wonderful. Um, I do have one question that I wanted to throw out there. Um, I'm a teacher by trade. That's what I do have been doing for the majority of my job during this pandemic. And it's um, teaching online and cha has changed everything about um, how I'm doing things and what I, I'm thinking about in my studio. So I'm wondering if your job um, this time apart, you know, that we've had to go through with the pandemic, uh, are there things in your job or about your company that maybe have shifted in perspective that you think will stay shifted because of this experience? And I wonder if anybody would want to discuss that, maybe lasting changes or shifts in perspective that you've learned in this last year. Mine has not changed. I actually, I love that. I love that it hasn't changed. And I, I was going to say the same. I mean, obviously there are little things like, you know, really getting dialing in your setup so that you, if you need a, you know, a decent microphone or like good lighting or where you're standing and things like that. But I mean, we have always been about preparing students for their auditions. We're still doing that. And I think that the mission has remained the same. And I think, yeah, I think that that's, it's amazing that even though we can shift to being online, so much of the core of what we do can remain the same. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been true for us, definitely. Um, and the benefit I'd say is that we can bring in faculty from anywhere in the world, students from anywhere in the world. We're running a spring training program right now and we have students in Chicago. We have a student in Argentina. We have, I mean, like, they're all over the place. So I love that about it. And I think that we'll probably you know, to answer your question about will you keep these things, I think even if we do run in-person programs, which I hope that we will again, um, I know that we will again, um, I hope that we will also run, you know, weekend workshops where it's virtual and we can bring in people from anywhere and people can attend from anywhere. I think that that's been a really, really yeah, great Yeah, the streaming, thing. I think this, like this summer, if we do anything in, in, in Graz, it would, it's going to be a mini thing. And I think we're going to have Thomas Hampson do a masterclass with singers there and, and we'll stream it here. So the streaming a little bit, something we ordinarily wouldn't do, but we're not as afraid of it now, now that, because it's more common. People are more used to doing this online thing, but uh, we don't really mess too much with our 50 years of successful formula. You know, teaching singing does not change. You learn how to sing in exactly the same way. So uh, we, haven't, we haven't changed too much. It's a different medium, but it's not, but but the job isn't really different. Um, right. There's there's some added aspects to it, as others have said. Um, our coaches actually found that they were able to coach really effectively, even though it was asynchronous. Um, we, you know, our classes were great. Same thing. We had students from Russia. We had students from all over. Um, one thing we discovered was is because we couldn't do our live performances, we started doing these Saturday night Zoom concerts and they were mainly, they were live concerts, you know, with your, with your phone and your laptop and whatever you could play it on. And um, these ended up being one of the community building um, events for us because we had them every Saturday at the same time, basically a team of singers and they were usually the ones who didn't have any of the bigger roles 
were thrown together and get, and they came up with a theme. They came up with their promotion. They came up with sometimes dialogue. They basically created sh little shows and that was their big project. And they were very popular, not only with the students, but with our audiences. Um, my favorite was they did a, a Zoomathon. They did what, what a, a fake marathon. And we ended up getting like $500 in donations from this fake marathon that they did. It was just so creative and fun. So I, I love that, again, coming back to the fact that I think that this online format can stimulate a lot of creativity. And that's what we want to keep going. We want to make sure that we do stream our programs for parents and, and fans who can't come see them live so that we can broaden our community and, and make because our, our opera for everybody. That's our motto. So we want to make sure it's available to even the people that can't walk in the door and sit in the seat. Right. I, I, I echo all of that. I, I think the, the biggest thing that will remain is this, this streaming thing that we, we've all been talking about and that we, talk, we have talked about that, um, doing something like that. It's very, <laughs> the internet here in Germany is not great. <laughs> and especially in this little village that we, uh, you know, we're kind of secluded in the Bavarian Alps, Alps. It's right on the border of Austria and Germany. And you're constantly switching back and forth between Austrian and German internet. And it's awful. So we, we haven't been able to do anything like that for our program. Um, and so I wonder, I haven't been to Kiefersfelden in a while. So I wonder how they've dealt with it. <laughs> Maybe the internet will be better. Um, but we have done some of these online workshops that we are gonna continue doing. Um, we've, we've found that it helps with our recruitment. It helps with our visibility. Um, it keeps our community connected. So I think it, rather than the core values changing, they've really just deepened by having another medium. Um, and this is something, um, you know, I, I'm always amazed at the, the students that just stay connected after our program. And this is just a, one more way for them to continue to do that. So we have, we've done some free workshops that our alumni have, you know, joined in um, doing as well. And, and that's something that will then just become part of what we do uh, in the future. Well, thank you all so much. This was been this has been really helpful and informative for me, and I'm sure all of the audience that's here too. So I appreciate your time. And uh, once again, I would invite everybody to look at the biographies that we have posted online and to check out the links to each of these companies. And um, just thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate thank it you. very much. Love meeting all of you. Thank you for having us. Yes. Good luck thank with your you. And your auditions. <laughs> yes, good luck. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.